We were having some technical issues, but uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Colin, for joining us. Where in the world are you? I'm in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Okay, great. Um, I was just talking to a colleague of mine the other day in in uh, Houston. Oh, wow, great. And we were just talking about how um, oh, this summer was something else. Yes, very hot, brutal. <laughs> yeah, brutal, brutally hot. So I'm glad that's changing. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Welcome everybody. My name is Joanne Butcher. I am a business coach. I work with filmmakers and this is the Filmmaker's Life. And in the Filmmaker's Life interviews, um, I always have a fun time because I get to meet another filmmaker and learn about your work and uh, your process. And the purpose um, of these interviews is to show filmmakers who are not as far along in their careers um how you did it and um is that Lloyd Kaufman again <laughs> no Lloyd who is that you look just like him and Lloyd is not a terribly uh usual no. name so <laughs> no it's just Lloyd Lathrop Lloyd Lathrop okay yeah. lovely to meet you um he's a little older <laughs> he's a little older yeah he showed up on one of my uh, one of my filmmakers' life the other day, and I oh, didn't wow. get to him fast enough, so I wasn't going to miss the opportunity again. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the purpose of this podcast is to show filmmakers how other filmmakers have done it and how they've moved their careers forward. And I think that the thing, um, even though I knew this before I started doing this podcast, the thing that's the most amazing to me is how unique every filmmaker's path is you know I think that we would all hope that there's a sort of you do this first and then you do that second and then you do that third mm -mm. <laughs> doesn't exist doesn't exist so anyway welcome Colin and uh the first question I always like to ask is when did you know that you were a filmmaker when did you first know you were a filmmaker well um interesting I mean I, I I think I always uh imagination in my mind when I was a kid I made up movies all the time and would play act them out um when I was very little so I mean I guess that was probably the beginning of the road I mean I would write little stories and stuff but um I would say it was about uh I was probably about 13 or 14 and a friend of mine um, we discovered his father had a eight millimeter video camera in his closet and we started making films that summer and we kind of like, you know, we would just make these ridiculously dumb, insane films <laughs> and him and I really loved doing it. I would do all the camera work and kind of come up with the stories we'd co kind of write and then he would be like an actor all the time. And that was kind of our thing. And then I went to I went to high school and studied. Um, you know, I started studying up on like film schools and stuff like that. And then you know, and then I went to film school. So yeah, I would say around you know uh, early junior high is when I kind of was like, I think this might be a path for me. But I don't have um, in terms of my immediate family, we don't. There's no one in the industry or anything, so it wasn't any sort of like. Um, you know, there wasn't any mentorship or any anything like a lot of other people I know where like, you know, there was somebody sort of like they knew or something. I, I really didn't know anything about the industry and I didn't have anyone to learn about the industry through I, until I got to college. It's, a, you know, I, I often share this uh, when I ask this question that when I was probably, I don't know, five, six or something like that, I um, I would have dreams about cowboys and Indians except in my dreams, I was always an Indian and we always won. And at the end of the dream, it would say the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, my, my parents, I didn't come from anybody who knew anything about films, but in more recent years, I've realized that my mother and my father both were film fanatics. Uh, my mother, it turns out had been doing, um, what's it called when it's like, anyway, amateur theater. I didn't know that until right before she died. 
And then my father was such a film fanatic that um, for the last 10 years before he died, he would be watching a movie on the big screen TV. And then he would also be watching another movie on his iPad. That multitasking. That's, that's... <laughs> well, that was about, well, he would just consume movies. And I was like, hm, I think that's where I got it from. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. So, so you went to film school. Which film school did you go to? I went to a school of visual arts in New York City. Mm, tell me a little bit about that school. I don't know. Is, does it still exist? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, school of visual arts is a is a comprehensive art school in in the heart of New York City. Um, it is. It's kind of like prides itself on the fact that the professors in uh well I'll focus on the cinema school because it's got a bunch of different schools but the mm -hmm. cinema school all the professors are working professors mm -hmm. meaning you know like the the cinematography classes are taught by cinematographers the editing classes are taught by actually working editors and so on and so forth so mm -hmm. um it's really uh it just was a perfect place for me because that's how I learn and I need to be like hands-on and, and right like day one they throw a camera in your lap you know, and then, <laughs> yeah, and that and that's part of my story that that I'm really proud of is that. So I went to school, and I fell in love with freshman year with cinematography. Um, I I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do when I got there, but I was like everyone else. I was like I wanted to be a director, and make films. But freshman year, I just fell in love with lighting and the camera and stuff, and so. That's, I actually graduated as a cinematography major. I was fortunate enough to win the, um, the award for best cinematographer uh, major for my year. And it kind of like, I, I still work as a cinematographer quite often. Um, and so that's, that's, um, that really set me on my path. But I, I, I just kind of like, at film school, I really learned, I focused so much more. I, I really didn't take, especially after sophomore year, I didn't take any really classes in anything beyond cinematography, a little right. bit of editing, you know. Um, and so that, you know, was just an incredible experience. Did, um, once you had graduated then, did you start working in the industry right then as a cinematographer? Did you just kind of leave school and go straight into it? No, I, I, um, so when I was in school, I got, I got great, I, I was, I just got great advice to sort of like get on any shoot, any shoot possible. Right. In my freshman year, I started working as an, a PA, a production assistant on, on different movies around New York City. Some were independent films, some were, were, um, student films. So what happened was, cause I was doing that so much by my, my junior year, I started working as a professional production assistant, like making money, you know, making a salary type thing. And so really how it, I, I would say like, I always looked at it as like a chart, like, you know, I would do X amount of production assistant work. And then I kind of started to become, you know, an, a, an AC assistant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But all the while I was shooting really uber, no budget or, or, or free work DP, you know, cinematography. Uh -huh. And I was kind of like had two two career paths happening at the same time. But the one that was making me money for rent was the PA one and the AC one. And yes. I got to a point where I joined the um, the union as an assistant camera. But I was still shooting, like I said, student films and really low budget movies and things like that. And so it was just like that part. But eventually I started camera operating and the AC work eventually melded to camera operating and then DPing and then, you know, probably about five to six years after film school, I, I was a working cinematographer 24 seven and I wasn't doing anything else after. Right. But it sounds like a, a perfect way um, because the school of visual arts was very kind of New York uh, focused. Do you think that being at that school helped you start to get this work was was the school instrumental in getting you even the PA jobs and the AC jobs was that helpful no they they, they yeah. were it's not that they weren't I mean I think that obviously that the skills they were giving me were were setting me up for that right but right um most of the work that I was getting was like I you know New York City um this was in the 90s, right? So New York City in the 90s had a vibrant, not that it doesn't now, I'm just saying had a vibrant, 
you know, community of, of work. And so I would, I would work for like VH1 and MTV and mm -hmm. things like that um, as a production assistant. But then there was all this work on the student level, getting involved in shooting student films and, um, and music videos and all these kind of things that are more kind of low budgety type stuff that is available to someone that's just out of college or things like that. So it's kind of like just word of mouth, growing contacts, building, um, you know, rapport with people that would go, oh, I really like that guy. You know, I, I want to work with him again kind of thing. And then as time goes on, you you kind of have a pocket filled of people that trust you and like you. And they just start filling up your calendar with work. Well, you do have a pocket full of people who trust you and like you if you're trustworthy and likable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I yeah. mean, I feel as though, um, you know, the film industry is the most relationship, aside from the military, and I've never been in the military, so I'm guessing, but it feels to me as though film is the, 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 the military is about the closest thing, because you have to be able to trust and rely on the person next to you in a way that I'm not sure happens when you're working for you know, Publix or Safeway, or when you're working in an office, you know, teams are very important and they train and all that stuff. But the fact is on a film set, you learn pretty quickly who you can trust and who you can rely on. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's everything is relationships. I always tell people that never burn a bridge, you know, unless the bridge is burnt, you know, unless it's somebody either you don't really you feel uh inappropriate around or you're not comfortable with right. or something but right. short of that you know i've had many relationships that weren't great with uh, with people i worked with but i was like there's no reason to burn the bridge because there's opportunities that come out of that so yeah i mean it's all about networking and and trying to get your your word up but also as as a freelancer to this day i'm still a freelancer um it's also about like you have to stay aggressive it's very exhausting, but you, you, you can't just be, you know, when, 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 even when you're on a job, you've got to be looking for the next job after that right. job. So it's yeah. like, I'm always putting feelers out, asking people, Hey, what's going on? Let me know if you have any shoots upcoming, things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, it never ends basically. Yes, exactly. And I've had a couple of experiences recently that have surprised me a little bit. Um, but uh, with filmmakers really being rude in the face of being offered an opportunity and being really rude. And I was like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting that because I'm, I'm expecting, you know, if you've at least got your first feature made, you've learned how to, you know, be around people. Yeah. And I've been yeah. a little taken aback with it. Um, and it's that thing about um, not burning bridges because, uh, I feel as though, why would you want to burn a bridge with me? Or if I introduce you to a sales agent, why would you want to burn a bridge with the sales agent? Why would you do that? It doesn't it make any sense. It doesn't no. make any sense. Um, and uh, funnily enough, one of my colleagues, I thought rather meanly made fun of me the other day because I said, um, well, my clients don't do that. And he said, oh, la di da And I said, what do you mean? I said, yeah. I really work on to train my clients to know how they need to behave in the industry and how to talk to people. And it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily come naturally. It sounds to me as though you really got that from day one, from before you even graduated from college, you really got that concept that about not burning bridges and about networking and you need to grow your network all the time. And the only way you can grow your network is by by being somebody that people want to be around. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, I'll tell you a short story. I, I was working with this guy who was a pretty accomplished um, director, cinematographer, edit. He does a lot of um, documentary work. So I had done a commercial with him as a first assistant camera for, for him. It was actually shot on film uh, probably around 1980, uh, 1998. And we were, we were driving uh, from one location to the next. And I, you know, at the time I was probably 23 years old and he was in his forties and we, I don't remember exactly where, why the conversation came up, but he said to me, he said, um, 
he had a he had a shoot in Alaska coming up and he was like he wasn't offering it to me right you know I didn't want to I didn't want to be too, you know, I want to go, but I, I, I was, I kept kind of asked, talking to him and he said, he goes, you have to understand like film, like filming a movie, a documentary, a commercial, you know, whatever it is, it, you, these are incredibly long days and you're around these people all day. Right. He goes, I have to like, you. <laughs> you know, because I, even if you're super great, but you're a big time jerk. You know, he's like, I don't know if, you know, if you, if he's like, I, I, you know, he had just met me, by the way, this is the first time we worked together. And he was like, I don't know you yet. You know, he's kind of basically telling me like, if, if I like you, yeah, I would consider you, you know what I mean? And it was such a, obviously I'm telling you this story now. And it was, you know, I don't know how long ago that was, but 1998, you know, and I've thought about it. I was like, I was like, wow, like that, you know, I remember almost getting insulted by it. At first, I was like, I, I'm good at my job. How <laughs> dare you? I, you said you liked my, my focus pulling. That's what I was doing on the film. I was focused on the commercial. I was doing the focus pulling. And, and, and then I just kind of like marinated on it. And I was like, I thought about like student films I had been on at the time and things like that. And I was like, yeah, he's right. Like you, you're spending, you know, so much more time than you spend with your family or loved ones. I was like, he's really right. You know, like there has to be a synergy there. There has to be, uh, you know, at least I guess now that I'm 47 going on 48. Now I think of what he said, I would amend it if I were telling somebody that, but I would say it's not so much. I have to like you, but we have to get along enough. Like we've got to be able to communicate well, and we've got to be able to enjoy each other's company enough that we're not like, oh, God, I, if he keeps talking, I'm going to throw up on the floor. You know what I mean? Like, it can't be a chore um, because, as you know, all of you know, I mean, making a film, there, there's kind of like with your crew, you eventually kind of have to have a second language almost, like an mm -hmm. unspoken ability to get something done or have something that you need done. And you can't really go through this whole process of, relearn reteaching stuff your language to other people so really i think that's what he meant in the big picture but it was such a i'll never forget it obviously but i i just to think about it a lot that like you know so i i guess for me and this is what i would project out is that what i took from that was be likable within a reasonable element of your personality you know like for instance um you know let's say you know the per you're working with someone who's a boston red sox fan and you're a yankees fan you know like maybe not go on and on about how boston <laughs> sucks or something you know what i mean like yeah buffalo <laughs> the, the buffalo sabers you know like don't make fun of yeah i just like like just try to obviously politics is a is a is a don't cross that road religion obviously these are things we're taught young, as young people not to talk at the dinner table it's just like stuff like that like don't cross lines just just right. stay in your lane and 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 be enjoyable to be around and you know things will work out and another way that i think it shows up in film and this is what i think he was saying to you this actually came to me not on a film set but when i went to work for the ymca to raise 38 million dollars <laughs> One of the uh, one of my co-workers said to me in my first week, well, we haven't seen you under pressure yet. We oh. haven't seen you under stress yet. That's when you really get to know somebody. So I think a lot of times a film set is a place for um, for a lot of pressure. And when people uh, can't deal with that pressure, they, oh, yeah. you find out you don't want to be around them. And that's why I think it's so much a relationship business because, okay, we saw you on the commercial. We saw you on that two day shoot. Now we know that we can be with you on the 10 day shoot or whatever it is. But, um, but that's, I, I re that's why I say, I think it's like the military, but, but you, you, you've learned so fast on a film set. I, I had a client one time, he was making his first feature and he um, he he um, I just got distracted. I, I always ask people to ask questions, raise your hand and ask a question. We save time at the end. Um, I don't like following the chat during the, the interview, but uh, he had to fire his sound person on day three 
And uh, I said to him, you know, the only thing I would have changed would have been make it day one. Because he oh, knew I on day one. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. He knew that he had made a mistake and he tried to live with it. But it, it it's better to go with firing people on day one. Um, if you if you've really you know made made a bad decision and everybody we all make mistakes you know but uh, I think it's I think it's that it's just that there's there's a lot of pressure and and you know and another thing I would say is that the less money you have you know the more it's a micro budget production the less you can afford to have a problem on your set you can you know because everybody's doing ten jobs so you know having somebody on your set who's complaining or whining or whatever it is mm -mm, no they gotta go so yes yeah, 100 so percent. this is really i was really looking forward to getting to ask you this question colin so um here you are you're working in the industry you're now worked up to being a dp and and all of that uh one of the things that i see with people who work in the industry because that is a that's a lot of pressure. That's a fast business. Boom, boom, boom. There's nothing that as fast as, as film, I think. Um, how did you uh, make a decision and or what did you what took you to make a decision to make your first feature film? How did you come to that? Because I see a lot of people in the industry get stuck and they can't make that transition. Because work is, you got to get more work. I got to get more work. I got to get more money. I got to keep working. I got to, and, and so they, it, it ends up that, that a lot of people who work, who make their living in the industry end up being the ones who don't make a film. So I'd love to hear how you did that. Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I would say that like, so what happened uh, for me was I, as I said earlier, like I went to film school and, and I definitely didn't expect to, to walk out of there a cinematographer when I first started, right? So I had gone and, and I, was, I was a working cinematographer for about seven to 10, I think around seven years. And I just started, I was on, I would be doing films with, for other people. And I just started to like fantasize I remember being on set and I was as a cinematographer and I would I'd start fantasizing like, like, I like this, but like, I wish I had more control over other elements, not just cinematography part. Right. And, and then I, I was kind of like, I had been writing, I wrote scripts all throughout high school, all throughout college. So I had scripts and stuff. I just, it wasn't, I was just trying to get them made. I would like can't give them out to friends and stuff in the industry. But I was never like, oh, I'll do it. Hmm. And then I kind of, my my wife uh, is a huge horror fan. And hmm. her mother and her were talking about a kind of uh, Mexican-American or Mexican, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Like a, you know, like a monster con concept called La Llorona, which has been, there's been oh, a ton yeah, of movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. La Llorona, and, yes. Yeah, and this was back in uh, 2009. And I, and they were like, oh, that'd be a great movie. And and I was like, yeah, that would be kind of a great movie. And, and mm -hmm. I just kind of like, I couldn't get out of my mind. And my wife's always been like a huge, like sounding board for me and, and so supportive. And we were going back and she's like, you should do it. Like you should just do a La Llorona movie. So in- Does she work in the industry? Like, Does she no, work in the industry? She's no, just she's a, a professor. Yeah, no. Oh, she's a professor of what? She, of uh, sociology. Ah, oh, yeah, she that's is like she loves movies. She's mm. not as much as your dad, <laughs> but <laughs> not but, two at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not two at a time. But she loves movies and and was always kind of interested in what I did. She used to like visit sets and stuff. And mm. so I just I I had this idea and then we just started rolling with it. And I I I met, I had a friend who was doing sound at the time professionally. Him and I got together and. The thing about me is um, I've always, my father instilled this in me. My mother is that like, you know, just visualize doing it and then go do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I never really, it's funny because I, I know what you mean and I get it and I, and I'm not above it at all, but I've never gotten in my way of that. To me, it's like when I, when I'm like, okay, it's time to make a film then I make it, you know, and, and to be honest with you, it'll, it would kill me not to like, yeah. it would be harder on me if I didn't, because then I would just be really depressed and struggle with the idea of like, 
oh, I never made that movie that I wanted to make. And so I think for me, it's like the minute I decide to do it, then it's like, okay. And then I start to plot out, like, how am I actually going to accomplish this? You know? So my first film, that was pretty much, I, oh, and also I scale it to the size at which my life can fit. That was, that's another thing. I, I have run across a lot of people that come to me with scripts or, or tell me about films they want to do and everything. And they're always scaled high. Way Even high. Though, yeah. And, and, and I always tell them, I go, you know, I, that's an amazing idea and write it, you know, but I'm like, do you ever think about writing it, a downsizing that idea as well? You could write two scripts. You could write a-, a, right. a <laughs> You could write 10. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, why not take that idea? Like I had a friend, who had this amazing sci-fi idea, sci-fi idea. And I said, why don't you write, write it all out how you want it. And then I said, then, I, and I can help you, but then why don't you play around with it? But, but think about friends who might have a bar or, oh, I know a guy who, who drives an Uber or I know a guy with a horse ranch, whatever, right? Start oh. to think of the things you have access to and scale you, that same sci-fi idea to, towards what you can have access to. And, you know, they were like, yeah, that's, a, that's something. I mean, they, they, they haven't made the film yet, but, but it's just that kind of thing. Like, I don't get intimidated because when I start the process, I immediately know I can do it. If I start a film that I don't know if I can do, I'm probably, it, it's going to be a trouble. So I, so I don't really have that problem because I'm not starting. I, I always know I can accomplish this film. I haven't done anything yet that, I, that I've started off and bitten off more than I can chew, which I would imagine that's probably a, a, an issue, right? Because we're dreamers. Everybody in this chat, everybody here is a dreamer. So we want to dream up amazing things, but then it turns out like I can't, I don't know how to get a spaceship to fly out of the sky and right. land and the guy to come out of it. You know what I mean? So I love I, that you brought up the um, idea of uh, a horse ranch because immediately I saw Nope in my mind. I don't yeah. know if you saw that movie, but um, yeah, yeah. because the 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 UFO was was kind of cool, but the horse ranch was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was really, yeah. really yeah. cool. Yeah. And the whole story about the horse family in Hollywood and all, it was so fabulous. Um, so there's another question. So why Mexican-American? Where did uh, that come from? Your, your mother, your wife, story? your wife said, oh, you know, this is a Mexican-American uh, oh, folk so my, character. Oh, my wife is uh, from Nicaragua. Oh, but yeah, but she was raised in San Antonio, which is, a, I don't know the exact number, but over 60% yes. Latino, but also mostly Mexican-American. Right, so, right. But, but La Llorona, as I did the research after she got it in my ear, uh -huh. was, it, it turned out it's kind of like a Southwestern U.S., Mex yeah. Northern Mexican kind of like folk tale. That was the word I was looking for earlier, folklore. Right, folklore, right? yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so... Um, but apparently it's kind of like, and also, you know, other parts of Latin America, it's, it's a story that's probably just trickled down through the, you know, through the decades that started parents in Nicaragua, Costa Rica would tell their kids kind of thing. Right. So that's why I said that, that it's typically uh, considered sort of a Southwestern U.S. Mexican-American. What, what um, is the legend of La Llorona? Oh, it's, uh, I, I, I'm going to butcher it. So if someone's watching that's Mexican-American, it's going to be like, yeah, this guy doesn't know what to talk about. <laughs> You're um, forgiven. So, You're pre-forgiven. Yeah, yeah. I want to put that <laughs> exclaimer out there. Uh, it's basic. Well, the, the reason I say that is because it's obviously has variations like any yeah. folklore does, right? So the, the understanding I have is that it's it's uh, a man, a, a well sort of like thought of man has this affair with a woman in a small village in Mexico. Or, and um, and I, I think they get married or not, I'm not sure, but either way, it doesn't matter. They have kids and that he he um, basically either divorces her or leaves her and she loses it and she kills, um, drowns the kids um, in a sort of defiance of him and saying, you know, you left us. So because of that horrible act, she's sort of left to sort mm -hmm. of wander the earth and mm -hmm. she's the moaning woman she cry, she's always crying, right. typically by like a body of water, like a lake or a river. Right. Um, 
and all that. So I, my story was called Sleepover and it was basically just a modern retelling, but it wasn't, it was, sorry, was not a retelling. It was a modern sort of point of view camera vi- uh, style, by the way, of mm-hmm. two, two uh, junior high, really early high school girls that have a sleepover and the mother's not, no one's home. It's just the two girls. And basically they're haunted by La Llorona, um, mm-hmm. who haunts their house and all kinds of crazy stuff happens after that. But uh-huh. it was all shot. Uh, most of it's in one take. Um, not my greatest hour, I'll admit, but I'm very proud of the start. <laughs> I was ironing out the key. Honestly, like you guys all know, I mean, I'm still ironing out the kinks. I mean, this, this... you know, that's so cool that you would be willing to say not my finest hour, no. <laughs> your first feature film. That is so cool. Well, I, I think you can all agree. I mean, I look at everything I've done and I'm all, I'm my, I'm my worst critic. And I, I have moments where I, it's funny, I, I, I don't know how you guys feel, but I, I have moments in the films I've made, because I made, this is, uh, I'm at seven feature films at this point. And it's like each one of them, I'll watch them. Thank you. Thank you. Each one of them, I'll watch them and like, I'll give myself moments. I'll be like, whoa, that's good cinema. But then I'll be like, that's crap. That is garbage, <laughs> Colin. You could do better than that. You know, I'll, I'll beat myself up about it. But typically like, it just like, I, I don't know. I mean, I love movies and I love great movies and I'm trying to reach, not great movie, but I'm trying to emulate the people that I, I revere and, and I hold myself to a high standard in that regard. I, I just want to be- and, and far more important than your opinion of your own work, what does your wife say? <laughs> My first screening, I did a short film and I, uh, I, she watched it and I'll never forget she- sat on on she just sat on the couch and she was just staring in the space and I was like uh what'd you think and her stare said it enough right and and she was like it's over and (laughs) that's all I had to know I was like oh man (laughs) she's uh she's she's very honest let me just say that she'll say this is a really good movie and then other ones, she'll just be a little, I know her so well, but, but she'll be a little like subtle with it. You know, like that was interesting, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but I like it because I kind of know where I stand. You know, she's such a movie buff and she's a horror. I do mostly horrors. Yeah. And so she is, she gives me a real good sense. I actually, you now the last bunch of movies, I usually show her a early cut to get a sense for where it's going and if it's working. Yes. And she'll tell me like, oh, I didn't understand that at all. What was that about? And sometimes it's actually created reshoots yeah. out of points she's made, you know, where she's been like, because she's a movie fan. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know how she does it, but she has the ability to sort of separate herself from being my wife mm-hmm. to be able to say like, that was, that wasn't scary at all. Like things like that, you know? And it was mm-hmm. it's so valuable to me because I, I don't know how you guys feel, but I, to me, I don't like, um, not a like, that's a hard word. I, I don't prefer filmmaker criticism of my film before it's done uh-huh. because I find that the criticism is a little bit more esoteric and kind of about the cinema. And I, I prefer, so what I usually do is I try to rent like a room at a library or something and I get average people or whatever we uh, want to call them. Oh, that's you know, great. People that don't make movies, yep. right? Yep. That are movie fans. I always say, like, I, I do put ads out on Facebook and I say, I'm looking for movie fans, not movie makers. And from all walks of life, and I show them the film, the early cut, you know, a, a cut that's good. And because I, I feel like I get kind of that initial response as a average, you know, they're, they're like, they'll tell me things that I've never thought of. Well, I really like that one character, but I didn't care about that other character. You know, you're like, oh, wow. Okay, so that, that, right. that character is not working, you know, things like that. It's just an amazing experience. Oh, it's fantastic to do test screening because it's so funny you bring that up because I just read the uh, results of a test screening professionally done by for one of my clients' films. And it was so interesting. And there were so many things in there that were just really curious. And it's it sent him off next week. He's... He's reshooting. He's doing the oh, reshooting, wow. reshooting the ending as a result of oh, the. Oh wow! Yeah, That's amazing. Um, and uh, he and he could see it exactly, you know. And it was one of those things where he said, "Oh, you know what? I thought 
about that. And then I put it to one side and then the test screening really showed him, no, he was right the first time he needed to redo the ending. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Very interesting. That's so awesome you, your first film, how did you come up with the money to make your first feature film? Uh, we, uh, it was so low budget. We just kind of used our own money, but Colin um, Chinchar, my co-partner, um, had a little bit of money that he he could use so he put up more than half of the money for it um, I think the it was probably budgeted like twenty two hundred dollars or something like oh that. wow yeah yeah <laughs> amazing so, the one thing I'll say is in 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 my neck of the woods in San Antonio um, mm. you can make I, I'm very fortunate that way that you can really make movies very cheaply because a lot of locations here can you can find for free um, or credibly low cost, um, you know, your overhead is so much lower than, let's say, in an, obviously in the New York uh, kind right. of area. So uh, that that was a huge part of it, you know. So over the years, you've made many films, and they're all horror films. Is that correct? Not all of them, but uh, ninety percent. Okay, because the ones I watched, I thought were very, very interesting. Um, now I'm not going to remember the titles, but if Emily puts them in the chat, I'll see one of them you already put in the chat was one of the ones I saw. And um, what I thought was that they were horror films, but this the, the very particular type of thing, which is that they weren't horror in the sense of, oh, there's, you know, demons and ghosts and witches and, you know, vampires. It was very contemporary real life horror if, if you know what I'm trying to say yeah right it, it, it was um and particularly horror for women horror horror that that women experience in their lives that is horrifying and um yes no promised land and domestic hell those were the ones I had watched and and so it's it's kind of they're, they're horror, but in a very particular sense. I don't know. I'm not being very articulate today. How do you think about that with with your with your movies? Um, yeah, no, I think that's fair. I mean, I I, um, I don't know. I mean, I think that I try. I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to go. I don't, I personally try not to go like overboard with like a point. Right. I try not to be too preachy. Um, but I, I also do think that there's a point to try to make a point of some nature in this story. Um, but I, I, a lot of times I'll just sort of like preference, uh, preference a, 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 a circumstance in my mind and, I, and it'll extrapolate from there, you know. Um, in domestic hell, I was, you know, reading stories of domestic violence and different things like that. And I stumbled on a story of a woman being like kind of, um caged in her in her in a bedroom kind of thing and that kind of like made me say that's an interesting backdrop for like a psychological thriller slash horror film like mm -hmm. how did she get there mm -hmm. what is the 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 circumstances and then and then it started to evolve into well who's the killer here who you know is this a serial killer is this a psychopath like what kind of what kind of people would do that? And then mm -hmm. it sort of keeps going. And so in, in that movie, it's about a couple where it's sort of like, not Bonnie and Clyde, but a couple that the, the husband's is, you know, pretty much a serial killer. And the wife is sort of domestically abused and manipulated to the point where she's kind of been going along with his desires for kills and doing stuff to women. And so she's, been playing the game with him and then obviously there's a woman that he has uh, uh, been holding captive for quite a while and so the story comes out from there and um and so it's like you know for me it's kind of like I try to um if it doesn't like just cut like no promise lamb was more I just thought of again the scenario that happens in Texas with migration situations and Native Americans and these kind of things I thought of you know what would happen you know what would the world look like for a woman that's you know native american and and a migrant um in a scenario where she got involved in this in a in a love uh enough love affair and was left with a child 
from the guy and has no money, nothing. Like what, what levels of desperation would, should, would she reach and the socioeconomic back, backdrops of that and, and, and that kind of thing, like desperation. So it kind of comes out of that, you know, like Remy's Demons, another film I made is about an autistic man raised. It's just like, I guess I get really caught up in that plot thing of like, well, what if, what, what happens? And then the story kind of unfolds because that one was an autistic, um, an autistic guy who in the story is now late 30s, early 40s, but was raised by a woman that practices witchcraft and satanic worshiping. So that's like all he knows, you know, all he, his whole worldview is what his mom has shown him. He's been pretty much isolated because of his autism and everything else. So he, but what would happen when his mother dies? And then how does he, how does he fit into the world without that, that person manipulating him and dictating how he sees the world? So it's just like coming out of those kind of concepts and, you know, those kind of things. I mean, yeah, well, it's. I, I guess actually listening to you, I would then call it psychological horror, right? It's, um, uh, and uh, I just love that because um, I feel as though, uh, you know, it's really odd. A lot of, a lot of people think when, when I, or when anybody says horror, they think we're talking about slasher films, right? There are so many different types of horror films and slasher films are one type. Um, I, I never watch any. I don't know if I could say I've ever watched one slasher film the whole way through, you know, but um, psychological horror, I'm like, I'm in, you know, and I think psychological horror is a great way of looking at all kinds of aspects of our society. I'm going to say this out loud, although it's kind of bizarre, but I just saw this thing the other day about a, a news piece about homeschooling and about this organization that has managed to make sure that there's never any oversight of homeschooling whatsoever. And in the piece that I saw, they gave an example of um, a group of something like 2,300 parents who are raising their children as Nazis. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's just like, it's perfect. Whoa, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, but 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 the but this one piece, one news story, um, which was about ten minutes long, there were just the stories that could come out of it. You know, yeah, you could yeah. make, you could do documentaries, you can make you know drama, but horror is a great way to approach something like that. That perhaps most people have never even yeah. talked about and bring something to people's attention by by looking at a very very contemporary topic like domestic violence or you know um that that scenario you talked about with the migrant actually that absolutely happened to a friend of mine who was brazilian who at 17 married an old american who brought her to america and she knew nobody oh wow and um yeah, the things that all the things that happen. So yeah, those, those, those are great stories to tell. But horror is a really fun way for audiences to be introduced to these topics. Yeah. So, yeah. so now what what what's your next step? You've made many, many films. What would be what would what's your vision for what what's the next step you would like to make with your filmmaking? The next step is kind of um getting, creating, finding an infrastructure to develop more films and also to curate my older films and find mm -hmm. a way to sort of cultivate a studio atmosphere, not studio in physical space, but studio in the classic sense. Um, and sort of like build a brand around mm -hmm. not only what I have coming coming out, but like the past films and and because my my biggest weakness has always been uh, marketing yes <laughs> and so yeah i'm terrible at it i i don't do it enough i i don't i don't i don't wrap my head around it it's a huge weakness so that's sort of like it's it's finding coordinating with with individuals that on a like-minded path in terms of interested in that part of things you know and figuring out how to create a you know build the brand around Oh, yeah. so Bressler Productions, or I have, I just started at Eating Crab Studios is, oh, that's where you, oh, they have great films over there, low budget stuff, but it's, it's, you know, 
horror stuff and psychological thrillers and these kind of branded things and, and genre pieces and um and sort of just building that out and creating a uh you know like i said i've said it multiple times but the brand out of it yeah. that's kind yeah. of the, the goal and and maybe the secondary thing is on on top of that is to either find a manager or an agent to sort of get some contract work as a director as opposed mm -hmm. to just a cinematographer because I, I do wow. a lot. That's what I still do for a lot, right? Yeah. So, you know, finding um, uh, opportunities to direct films um, for other people, other scripts and other studios. So it's, a, it's probably those two paths, I would say. Yeah, nice. Um, I, I have a suggestion for you around the marketing. We can talk offline, but um, yeah, I'd like to make Thank an you. introduction. Let's just save the last few minutes and see if anybody wants to ask a question. Um, just raise your hand or raise your virtual hand and come on and ask a question. Don't be shy. We won't bite. <laughs> Juliet had something she was saying before. If you can come on. Just wait. Okay. Um, so Hi, I'm here. Yes, go ahead, Juliet. <laughs> hey, um, hi, it's really nice to meet you. Um, I also am a huge fan of horror. Um, so many things that you you said today really resonated with me. Um, scaling down really just like was a gut punch for me. I, um, as Joanne knows, I've been working on this horror film that I kind of accidentally pitched at a at a um, at a media market once for Joanne, and it kind of took off on its own, and it hadn't even been written down yet and it kind of really just overwhelmed me that they were like we want this story now and I didn't even have it written down wow. um but I am now you know um it's in development I, I just finished my first draft and I'm like what the hell is this like this is huge um but the idea of having two scripts um, because it is something that I would like to also develop. I've applied for um, writing residencies uh, where I get to, you know, get grant money and um, and make this film my, for myself. But, you know, the grant is like pretty low, you know, micro budget. And I've been at, you know, I, I think I submitted like three times. And this time they actually told me like, we want you to submit, submit again and submit the last, you know, what you submitted before. So it seems very promising. And I'm just like looking at what I have written in this first draft and knowing that this is the budget that I would have. I'm just like, what am I going what to do? What is that number, Julia? What is the number that they're talking uh, about? 50,000. Okay. Yeah, so um, hearing you talk about scaling it back and just what it, what resources you do have really helped me to try to look at how I can still tell this story um, the way I want to tell it, but maybe not with the huge locations that I. Well, I um. Oh, I think we just lost Juliet. Oh, what a shame. Well, it's okay. We're recording this, so when she. She can watch the recording and see your answer. Go well, ahead. I was just going to say that. Um, so I, uh, I'm writing my biggest story right now. I felt I read what she said resonated with me as well. Is, <laughs> um, but I even with that, I scaled it right because I, I didn't even start the process of looking for funding. But even with that, Juliet, she's back. Hello. Um, so sorry uh my someone called me and i pressed the wrong button new phone <laughs> oh i no, i was just gonna say that um i i what you said resonated with me um in that i'm starting a project that's a little bigger a lot bigger than anything i've done but what i would say is um you know i guess ask yourself if you haven't already you probably have but ask yourself like what is the themes of my story and what really at the end of the day is the most important thing that my story mm -hmm. is trying to tell because like, let's say, and I don't know your story and, and I don't want you to share it unless you, you know, I, it's enough intellectual properties, but, but I, to me, it's like, 
it, let's just say it's a vampire film set in 1712, right? Mm -hmm. So you ask yourself like, well, it, or this will be my process would be, okay, one, do is it, does it need to be set in 1712? Can it be set in 2013, right? That'll be my first thing. If my answer was, yes, it needs to be set in 1712, um, and it needs to be vampires because the themes and everything about it don't work unless it's those things, then I would say that, I, or this is my process, I would be like, okay, let me, let me dive around and see if I can already have access to a housing or building that can work in that way. Or mm -hmm. if not, um, let me see about people that I might know through the grapevine, Joanne might know, or, or other people I am in touch with um, that do uh, CGI work. I know those, those letters are, are ugly for a lot of people. They're also <laughs> sound expensive, but they're yeah. not as expensive as you think. I, I, that's, the movie I'm doing now is gonna rely heavily on that, but not in, in a way, not in the way you think, right? Because I'm not going to, I, I think a lot of times that that is a dirty, you know, CGI, right? Yeah. In that when we create humans or monsters or creatures, it just always, it, it just looks bad. And it also doesn't hold up the test of time. But I'm talking about more about atmosphere and space, right? Uh -huh. Because you could say, I, I, I need to be able to show this creepy mansion, which is a huge part of my story. It has to be a creepy mansion because the creepy mansion is where the ghosts come from. And if it's not creepy, man, right? But you don't, you're like, I can't find one. You might know someone that can render and create one. And then your job is really finding ways where you can elicit from the audience and, and, and almost like magical sleight of hand that the audience, you just need the audience to understand it's 1712. After right. that point, whether they're in a room that I'm in or someone else's room, now that's more about decoration, props, and mm -hmm. now you've scaled down. Now you now you're in a market of like, I need a, a lamp that could have existed. Obviously, they didn't have lamps, but you know, right. a candlestick or whatever. So that's kind of like that's the way I I I've been going about it with this. I'm doing a sci-fi project that takes place a thousand years from now. So I'm big, but I've been going through well, what would the world look like in thinking about that? But I I found someone who does these CGI renderings for a really reasonable price that definitely could fit within 50,000. And, you know, the, the key thing is I'm like flexibility. Well, what if I gave you a ton of time to do these renderings because you have a full-time job doing rendering, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of stuff. So I, I then work around, well, he's, he need, he's gonna take six months. So should, I should do all my CGI shots first. So while I'm filming other things, he's doing my CGI and then we're going to meet in the middle <laughs> mm -hmm. because I've now finished principal photography and he actually has done 80% of the renderings of the mansion or whatever it is. What, so that's what, one I thing. Actually, what I actually heard in what you said, Juliet, was you said, this is huge. And so yeah. the first thing I would actually work on, I thought Colin's ideas were great, the first thing I would work on would be to, we do things in our minds to frighten ourselves. So this is huge, is very frightening. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas, you know, asking a neutral question of, okay, so how do I make this a, a $50,000 uh, project is a different mm -hmm. question, right? Then, right. so huge. <laughs> That's very paralyzing. <laughs> yeah, it is. And um, and then uh, the other thing that I would say is that, so I just put um, Kay's film in the chat that was made for a ridiculously low amount of money. And it's set in the late 19th century and it's in a historic house. And just, you know, your, your example, Colin, of, you know, it's set in 1712. But um, yeah, you would never guess this movie was made wow. for a ridiculously small amount of money it was made for. But um, they ended up uh, shooting it in Ireland because they had some film friends who owned a, a, an 18th century house. Wow. And they were able to shoot the house and, and house the crew and the actors in the one property, right? Wow. And, and so, um, 
back to Colin's idea from early on when he said, well, maybe you have a friend who has a horse ranch. You know, it's more about finding what you have access to than mm -hmm. saying, oh, this in the script has to be in this particular place, you know? Right. Um, but I do think it's a mental thing to, to start with. Um, I'm going to mm -hmm. make a micro-budget film and, and how do I make that work? Right. Thank you so much. I have one more question for Colin about uh, horror and like the, the writing, the themes and the tropes, um, sometimes cliches if needed, that are necessary to drive that genre. Um, how do you go about creating that uh, jump scare? You know, you mentioned how sometimes your wife is like, well, that wasn't really that scary, but then there are things that she found very good. Um, how how do you um, what's the word? How do you how do you um, how do you find what's scary? I mean, for me, I, I kind of like I work from what I think is scary first. Mm -hmm. I mean, I focus on just kind of like what I think would what I think would be scary. And, and freaky. Um, and then I kind of branch out from there and think of universal, universally scary things, um, shadows, darkness, creepy house, you know, those kind of things. Um, and, you know, it's really like, a, in terms of jump scare, I, I believe is like a, like a editing kind of rhythm thing, you know, mm -hmm. in, in your shots and in your editing kind of finding almost like a joke in a in comedy is all about writing and rhythm to the joke in the post it's the same to me with jump scare type things but overall i mean i think that um focusing your on the scare being you know what you would find scary what you think is you know uh universally scary and working from there um you know because obviously like everybody's different right some people aren't scared some people are scared of water some people are scared of fish some people are scared yeah of water, you know what i mean so right really like but like in the script i'm feeling like in the script i'm trying to create that fear uh visually i can see it and i know um as a director i can make it but to make sure the reader also sees it that's you know i was yeah, wondering how you, yeah yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, right. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I just have, I have a meeting that I have to get to. So I, I have to unusually finish right on time, but I thought that was a great question. But if you could just answer that quickly, that would be great. Go ahead. Colin. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I think it's a great question. I think that in writing, I mean, I think you just, you have to write it as clearly as possible so that the reader understands your intention, you know? Um, write it out as succinct and as clearly that the the audience might not literally jump scare while they're reading it but they'll understand what your intent is you know what i mean because you want your script reader to to just they have to understand what you're trying to do with this story so like mm -hmm. in that moment just make sure that you don't like write quote unquote jump scare right but but like you just got you have to make sure it's clear like henry opens a closet door and he his girlfriend jumps out scaring the crap out of him you know what i mean if i read that i would understand okay so she this is like a classic jump scare moment in her film right. you know what i mean right. it's not necessarily it's not going to scare me like stephen king book would in that moment let's say in the script but but as a, if I'm thinking about purchasing your film or, or working on it, whatever, I, I would get it like, or as a cinematographer, I would read that and go, okay, so this is important. Like the lighting has to be a certain way. I, she really she really wants this to freak the audience out at this point, right? So it's right. Just, I always tell people like with your script, because I, I'm a cinematographer, like just think of your art department, your cinematographer, your editor, all these people have to read this without you around they need to know exactly what your intentions are because you don't want to have 500,000 questions. Maybe you want 200. You're still going to get 200,000 questions, but try to get it down from 500,000 because that's what I would be like, hey, is that a jump scare? Did you want a jump scare there? Because if it's not clear, you know what I mean? 
and that's also true of anyone writing reading your script you want to make sure they understand all of your intentions mm -hmm. thank, thank you so much, much. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet, for the great questions. Yeah, it was great. And by the way, Juliet, it's all in the sound. Just <laughs> very true. Um, thank you so much, Colin, for joining us today. Ask oh, so much fun. Thank you. all my questions <laughs> and Juliet's questions. That were great. Um, and uh, yeah, we definitely need to need to talk. I want to talk to you about marketing. Uh, thank you for coming and listening today. And um, you will find all of our interviews in our Filmmaker Success YouTube channel once Emily gets a chance to upload it and on Spotify now. Woohoo! Um, I don't know how she does that, but anyway, she does it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my name again is Joanne Butcher. I'm a business coach. I help filmmakers raise money to make their movies. And uh, thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye.